my name is Jessica Oker. Some of you guys know me from uh, the work comp industry, uh, but I also have a passion for um, something called Ayurveda. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And I am blessed to have my partner here with me, Annette. Um, she's an Ayurvedic counselor, um, and we're going to go through a little presentation to kind of bring people up to speed on what is Ayurveda. And if there are any questions, it's very interactive. If you guys have questions throughout, some of these concepts are very foreign um, to most individuals. So if you have questions, speak up um, or put something in the chat. If not, we'll go through it at the end as well with a few minutes to address any questions that anybody might have. So we're going to talk a little bit today about what is Ayurveda. So um, Ayurveda is kind of hard to say, uh, but it actually is a little bit more familiar than most people realize. Um, Ayurveda is a little bit more of a parent science. Things that fall underneath that umbrella would be yoga, meditation, acupuncture, acupressure, herbal medicine, um, even color therapy, light therapy, crystals, home design. It all uh, goes up to Ayurveda. So um, Ayurveda is an ancient complete science. It literally translates to the study of life. Ayur is study and life is Veda. It's a holistic system of wellness. It predates traditional Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine is actually rooted in Ayurveda. Um, it's well started being written down over 5,000 years ago. It is sprung from um, an area in ancient India. The goal of Ayurveda is to teach us how to live our lives without suffering, right? We want to address the root cause of any imbalances that an individual might have, address toxins within the body. And the goal is that if you give the body what it needs, according to Ayurveda, you will automatically drive wellness. So it is a root cause type of modality. There are eight branches of study in Ayurveda. One is internal medicine, pediatrics, surgery, ENT. Um, there's a head and psychotherapy division. Also toxicology, uh, rejuvenation, which would be more aligned with uh, geriatrics and sexuality. So there are a lot of practitioners that just focus on infertility um, in that arena to help people become more productive sexually. So again, Ayurveda is a blueprint for wellness. It empowers individuals to honor their unique constitution. Ayurveda believes that every individual is unique and they all have a different set of needs and um tools that are needed to bring to those needs to address them, right? So we want to find people's balance, align them with their true nature, and we do that through lifestyle um, adjustments and herbal energetics. I always like to include Ayurveda's definition of health because it's a little bit different. Um, I kind of spotlight the WHO. Recently, the WHO did incorporate the mind into their definition of health, but historically that was not part of um, a Western diagnosis of health or description of health. Whereas Ayurveda says that um, one is in perfect health when all three energies, and we call them vata, pitta, and kapha, and we're going to talk about what those are. They're called the doshas. When someone's digestive fire, right? So that's not just being able to digest, but it's also, are you assimilating what you eat? Are you processing what you eat? And is your metabolism functioning appropriately? When those things are aligned, then all of your bodily systems and organs and tissues should be receiving um, nourishment and they should be functioning properly. We also focus on excretory functions. We talk a lot about um, bowel movements and urinary movements and appropriate frequency and consistency to maintain health. Uh, once all of those are aligned, it is said that if those things are working in perfect order in combination with a pleasantly disp disposed, contented mind, body, and spirit, or sense and spirit, then you are in perfect health, according to Ayurveda. Um, any questions on that so far? So um, while it's Eastern medicine, uh, most practitioners recognize that it's a very symbiotic relationship with Western medicine. Um, similar to Western, uh, Ayurveda believes that prevention is obviously key. Uh, Ayurveda breaks it down into six stages of disease. So for example, the first three, you might go to your physician or your treating physician and say, I just don't feel right. I'm not feeling quite well, but I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, and they'll do some studies and maybe they won't find anything. Um, Ayurveda would say that you're in three stages and below. Uh, once you get to stage four, we start to see anatomical changes that register um, on the human body, right? So maybe you'll get an MRI or maybe you go in and tell the doctor, I have a little too much heat in my stomach, but by then you have acid reflux and maybe it's affected your esophagus, right? So then you're going down that 
train track towards stage six, right? So Ayurveda works very well in, uh, we use tongue analysis and some other tools to determine if nothing is showing up in Western yet, where are you at beforehand? So we could kind of back that track up. Um, or if you are stage four, five, and six, we work symbiotically with Western medicine to kind of come up with a plan to make people biologically available for acute types of Western uh, medicine that needs to be applied, right? So we work with people who have cancer, for example, maybe you're going through chemotherapy. Ayurveda does an excellent job of balancing digestion so that people can feel good while they're going through it, stay healthy, boost their immune system, um, and get through the treatment plan that they need to get through with as minimal collateral damage as possible. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what is a dosha, because we mentioned you need to have these things aligned um, for perfect health, right? So they're going to sound a little hokey at first, um, and I'm going to have um, Annette kind of dive down deep. But first, I'll let you guys know that it really governs who you are physiologically, but also psychologically, right? So we break them down into something called vata, pitta, and kapha. And what you identify with, typically two are going to be dominant, um, kind of dictates how you exercise, how you sleep, how you eat, um, and where you live even, right? So before we dive down into it, I'm going to kind of do an overview of them really quickly. So Ayurveda believes that there are five energies within the body and we, this is where it kind of sounds hokey. They're going to be earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Um, however, earth is really just your muscles, right? It's the structure within the human body. It's your bones. Whereas water is going to be moisture. It's going to be your lymph system, the, um, moisture in your intestines, the moisture in your eyes, fire, is cellular uh, metabolism, right? Cellular respiration, bile, digestive enzymes, um, things that transform within the body. Um, it's a heat energy, right? So then we have um, ether is going to be more space between where you have electrical currents in your heart. So for example, your heart is an electrical instrument. It, if you take it to more of a metaphysical plane, it's going to be your quantum field. Uh, but mostly we look at it from a systemic um, outlook where we don't want someone to be constipated. We want the bowels to have room. We want no cholesterol, high cholesterol within the body. We want the body to be efficient. So we need to have space in the physical body so that it is efficient, kind of like a car engine. So um, changing your oil regularly would kind of be an analogy for that. Um, then we have um, air that is going to be um, cellular, I mean, uh, respiration of the lungs. It's going to be the peristaltic movement of your intestines, but it's also your nervous system. So we take these three, five elements and we water them down into or categorize them down into three categories. And they're called vata, pitta, and kapha. Whereas vata is going to be earth um, in ether and air. Pitta is going to be earth and water. And kapha is going to be earth. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Pitta is fire and water. And uh, kapha is earth and water. My apologies. So we look at people who have a vata predisposition. They're going to be kind of the thinner people. They're quick to be very cold. They are very connected. They tend to be very empathetic. They're creative. They're the authors of the world. And uh, when they get in balance, they're more prone to different types of issues. Pitta people are going to be processes of information, right? Because we said that they're water and fire. So they can are the account managers of the world or the business owners. They take so much information, they process it. And Kafa are kind of the teddy bears of the world. They're going to be um, very good conservators of energy. Um, they're people who don't spend a lot of money. They are have a handful of lifelong friends. So I joke with people that if you're getting on a plane and you bring a book with you, but you get super distracted and you never, ever open that book, you're probably more Vata predominant. Whereas if you get on that plane and you read that book, because you have every intention of reading that book because you brought that book, um, and that's the plan. You're more Pitta predominant. 
Um, if you don't bother getting on the plane because you have books at home and you're really happy sitting on the couch, you're probably a little bit more copper predominant. And so Annie's going to take over and kind of give you guys a little bit more deep dive into each of these doshas. Um, before we move forward, are there any questions? Okay, I'll leave it to Annie. All right. So first, we'll start with Lata and go back to that again. So like Jess mentioned, Vata is associated with air and ether, and it rules the energy of communication and movement in the body and in the mind. And um, so Jess touched on this a little bit, but we have um, all three of the doshas within us, and we're born with a certain amount of each dosha being predominant. So someone can be born with more Katha, someone can be born with more Vata or with Pitta. And then as we go through life, we tend to accumulate doshas and that puts us out of balance. So um, someone of Vata nature can go out of balance in a Vata way. Um, but also if you do have a Pitta constitution, you can also accumulate more dot. Uh, vata in your body and in your mind and also go out of balance in a vata way. So um, a vata imbalance when we have too much of that vata energy built up within our body and our mind can look like bloating, gas, indigestion, constipation, systemic dehydration. Uh, like just mentioned, it uh, affects our nervous system and that can develop into problems like insomnia, anxiety, and chronic stress. So what increases this energy of Vata within us? And this is pretty easy in our fast moving modern life. We do see a lot of excess Vata. Um, so the first thing is going to be trauma, whether that's a traumatic birth, uh, an injury or experiences uh, that can be like physical, mental, or emotional experiences. And then also living a fast-paced lifestyle, especially if you don't have a regular routine that you're doing, if you're traveling a lot, eating at different times of the day, and then also um, exposed to a lot of excessive mental and physical activity, overstimulation, uh, dry, cold weather, and then also cold and raw foods also aggravate vata, consuming stimulants, and also, like I mentioned, excessive travel. So you can see why our modern life um, has the tendency to put the push the vata energy out of balance. Next, we have pitta, like we mentioned, is associated with fire and water. Uh, like just mentioned, this is the energy of digestion, metabolism, and transformation. <clears throat> so someone who has accumulated excess pitta or heat in their body is going to have symptoms like heartburn, acid reflux, excessive hunger, irritable bowels, sensitive skin disorders, whether it's rashes, hives, or, or acne. <clears throat> you can have sensitive or burning eyes, inflammatory conditions, and overheated liver. These people are also um, prone to get frustrated or angry. Um, easily irritated, and they're also um, uncomfortable in really hot weather. So what can increase Pitta? <clears throat> Lots of things in our modern day that can increase Pitta also. Exposure to chemicals in our water and food, processed food, consuming oily or fried foods, spicy and overly acidic diet, overly strenuous and competitive activity, whether it's physical or mental, Coffee, alcohol, tobacco, excessive exposure to heat and sun, and overworking. There, There's two comments in the chat, Sam. Unfortunately, oh. I'm not able to pull them up. Are you able to let us I know? I can see them. Just okay. people saying hi. Oh, oh okay. Um, <laughs> Sanji says hi. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay, so next we have Kafa. Kapha, like we mentioned, associated with earth and water, and this is the energy of stability and structure in the mind and in the body. If we accumulate excess Kapha, we're going to see things like depression, apathy, lack of inspiration, slow metabolism, constipation, edema, and swelling, bone spurs, lymphatic, sinus, and lung congestion, sugar disorders, weight gain, and obesity. So what increases Kapha? Um, consuming foods that are heavy, oily, sweet, and cold. Examples would be dairy, sweets, excessive uh, consumption of 
grains, cold drinks, cold, rainy weather, <clears throat> a sedentary lifestyle, and spending too much time indoors, and also uh, oversleeping. I'm doing this one, right, Jess? Sure. Okay, cool. Okay, so we touched on this a little bit when we first started, but why is digestion so important in Ayurveda? So <clears throat> when we consume food, really um, what we focus on in Ayurveda is that we're able to digest and assimilate all of the food that we're eating. Not only does this give us uh, like healthy, healthy building blocks for our body, but it also ensures that we don't develop something in Ayurveda that we call ama, which is actually toxicity. So this is when we're consuming food and it might even be really healthy food, but we're not able to fully digest it. And so it sits in the digestive tract, undigested becomes ama um, and becomes toxic to our body. And this is said to be one of the main causes of disease in Ayurveda, which is why we focus so much on proper digestion and elimination. So also, um, good digestion ensures the development of what we call ojas in Ayurveda. So when we're able to fully digest that food and use it to really nourish our body, um, we develop this subtle energy that's developed in the body that's really our true health. It's our vitality, it's our immunity, it's our resilience to stress, and it's our strength and our fertility. So digestion is really important in Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. I, I always like to slide, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I put, I joke because I put this in cursive to make Alma look prettier, um, but mm -hmm. we really do look at Alma as the root of all disease. So if we're not, like any said, processing nutrients fully, they're sitting in our belly, maybe that transit time isn't appropriate or um, you're constipated, you're going to develop this byproduct called ama and so it's really that rotten sludge that clogs all our arteries our organs our channels it sticks to the gastrointestinal tract it gets under your skin as well as the channels of your mind so if you have that acne it's coming out of the body if you have high cholesterol you have ama and a great way to kind of check it is look at your tongue right so if you look at first thing in the morning if you look at your tongue in the mirror if there's any coating on your tongue whatsoever you have ama, right? And so I kind of tell people we all have it because we live in a modern life. And there's a study that I always like to quote um, from the EPA in 2019, where they um, admitted that there are 3.4 billion pounds of chemicals released into the environment in the US alone. And 60 million pounds of these were classified as OSHA carcinogens. So if you're someone who's ever increasing foods that you think need to be eliminated to your diet, from your diet because you're having an intolerance or a reaction, Ayurveda would tell you that avoiding these foods is not going to address the root cause. We have to get to the root cause of immunity within the body and digestion that is driving those types of immune responses. Um, we also look at seasonal, right? So if we're not eating seasonally the way we used to, we're building up those energies in the body, kind of like what Annie talked about. So let's say you're a pitta person, you tend to get hot, you are very good at metabolizing things. It's summer, it's hot outside. If you come in and eat like a greasy hot piece of pizza, you're not going to feel well, but it may be watermelon might be the right choice for you at that moment in time. So we look at qualities of foods a lot and their seasonality and those energetics so that we can not just remove toxins from the physical body, but also remove those seasonal energies. So if you're someone who gets a little angry in summer, or maybe you are stressed to the max and really nervous at Christmas, those are good signs that those energies are building up within the body. Um, so we talked a little bit about being able to see your tongue um, in the morning and uh, there is a nice little chart in Ayurveda that shows you the locations of the organs on the physical body. And so we do look at these um, to see, you know, if there are cracks present on your tongue, that's a sign of increased vata. If your tongue is pale, right, we know the digestion is weak and we're probably looking at anemia. Um, if you feel foggy in the morning, maybe you're unmotivated and tired, or you just feel weak for no apparent reason. Uh, maybe you have a regular cough you can't get rid of. You're easily exhausted mentally, physically, and there is no identifiable cause. 
maybe you're sad and you have no identifiable cause to be sad and you just don't know why you're sad. Um, you could catch a cold a couple times a year. Um, and if you have less than two full bowel movements per day and have any experience of brain fog, those would be triggers where we would say, okay, this person is probably compromised by ALMA. So Ayurveda would kind of systemically go down through this chain to uh, remove the toxins from the areas that we see on the tongue and through conversation that are being compromised by AMA so that we can support those organs with detox. And one of the other key things that I'm, I'm not sure if it's on one of our slides is um, Ayurveda. Oh, here it is. Yeah, this is what Annie's going to talk about next and how when you take one bite of food, Ayurveda believes there's a layer or a chain where that nutrition goes down the line and it takes um, 35 days to get to the last system. But I'm going to let Annie talk about that. Well, okay, so yeah, this is just going back to what I was saying before about the um, importance of proper digestion, right? So we take food into our body and it's digested um, in the stomach first and then is hopefully able to nourish, if we have healthy digestion, each tissue layer of the body. And like Jess mentioned, it's said to take about 35 days to get through the entire cycle. So first, the food will nourish the plasma, then the blood, muscle, then our fat, bone, um, our nervous system, and then our reproductive tissue. And once it gets to that last layer of uh, nourishing the reproductive tissue, what we have left over is what we mentioned earlier is that energy of the ojas, that true health in Ayurveda. So every bite of food that you're taking, like what you're eating today, isn't going to serve your full body or your immune system, according to Ayurveda, until 35 days has reached. So it takes time, right? But you also have an enormous amount of power with what you choose. Mm -hmm. So we talk a little bit about, you know, what, what it, so we talked a little bit about Ayurveda, but what happens when you actually work with an Ayurvedic practitioner? So if you want to work with an Ayurvedic practitioner, they're going to ask you an enormous amount of questions, right? So we talk a lot about um, digestion, bowel movements, um, traumas, accidents. There isn't a lot of diagnoses that are necessarily talked about in Ayurveda because we look more at a system imbalance. They're not going to just look at one part of the physical body. We look at the entire physical body because, as you can see, we consider it to all be connected. We do to tongue analysis and lifestyle analysis. And then an Ayurvedic practitioner can recommend certain herbs um, as well as lifestyle changes. Um, each dosha tends to eat a little bit differently, right? So while one person... Uh, maybe, you know, a vata person needs more warm, hot, spicy foods to help manage their digestion. That might really aggravate a pitta person, especially in summer when they need to cool down and they have inflammation spiking in the body. Um, kapha people tend to drink one glass of water and gain five pounds, right? So they can eat perfectly well, but if you're not eating for what your body can metabolize, we're going to be having an impaired digestion and creating that ALMA, right? So we talked about lots of things, um, and but what are some tools that you can kind of walk away with on your own? What can you put in your own toolbox that maybe you can do on your own that is an Ayurvedic uh, routine? And they're very big on having like a morning routine and things like that to set your body up and your mind up for the day so that you can have an impact on the physical body. Um, I think this is your slide too, Amy. Yep, I'll go ahead. Yep, so the first thing that you can do to start your Ayurvedic journey would be learn what your dosha is. And then once you do learn your own constitution, you can begin to eat a specific diet for your constitution. So like just mentioned, if you're more vata in nature and, and you're in balance, you're gonna eat going to want to eat more warming, grounding, cooked foods. Someone who um, has a pitta imbalance is going to go towards cooling foods, fresh foods, and then the kapha. Um, also, you can add in more spicy, pungent, dry foods. <clears throat> Next, um, you can learn about your dosha and different activities in your life and whether or not those are aggravating or balancing your dosha and then incorporate more 
balancing routine into your lifestyle. <clears throat> also, being asleep by 10 p.m. is recommended for everyone, and also rising with the sun. Eating through uh, eating your three meals at a set time per day. Uh, this helps the body know when to expect food and to digest it properly. Snacks are recommended to be fruit eaten alone. We don't combine fruit with other foods in Ayurveda because it's digested differently. Also, you can start your day with warm water and lemon. Also, learning how you can use spices to stimulate di your digestion, drive elimination, or even cool off the body. You can incorporate ghee, which is clarified butter, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And then also uh, establishing a morning routine. Jess has mentioned this previously also, but in Ayurveda, our morning, morning routine is called Dinacharya, and that includes things like oral oil pulling, tongue scraping, and daily oil massage, which is called abhyanga. And this helps to keep the body lubricated and nourished and grounded, but also helps with uh, daily detoxification. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that Annie mentioned, because they're, they're really important. So getting to sleep by 10, why, right? So Eastern and Western agree that by 10 o'clock at night, your body starts kind of taking out the trash. Your metabolism starts to kick up, your liver and everything starts to work a little bit at a higher rate so that the body can eliminate all that's been accumulated throughout the day. If you are not asleep by 10, will those functions still occur? Yes, but not at an optimal level. More important, once your body starts these processes, you wake up. So if you can't fall asleep by 10, you're probably someone who will be up till about two, right? So we always want to encourage people to be asleep by 10. Rising with the sun is important because it sets your metabolism for the day. Um, eating at those set meal times, basically you're just training your body to be on a schedule. One of the things uh, that we also uh, mentioned in Ayurveda, she talked about eating fruit, fruit alone. They also look at other food combinations. So for example, eggs and cheese combined are a big no-no in Ayurveda. Um, they don't believe they can be fully digested. And again, if not fully digested, they're going to create an off uh, product called ama. So they don't like to see eggs and cheese alone. And I know there's a lot of people like, oh, I eat fruit with my yogurt. And I think it's super healthy. Ayurveda would ask you to separate those two and put some space in between maybe 45 minutes to an hour before you eat that fruit. Um, the morning routine at the Abhyanga, we talked about a little bit about the oil. So we can use regular oils like sesame. Um, if you're high pitta and have a lot of inflammation, coconut might be better for you. There are also a lot of herbal formulas out there that are designed for vata, for pitta, and for kapha, or maybe other types of um, diseases that we're trying to mitigate or manage, what you do is you basically slather up in the morning. So you'll put oil on your body um, from head to toe. You'll start at the top, long strokes on the arms, circular motions on the joint. And in an ideal perfect world, you'll sit there for 20 minutes and let it really soak into the physical body. Um, I tell people it only takes 90 seconds to get to the bone. Um, so it, you will use the skin as a medium to deliver herbs that need to get into certain organs. So we use this as a tool. A lot of times, if you're not able to, if you look at your tongue in the morning and you see that there are teeth marks on either side, we know you're not digesting. We know that there's an issue with malabsorption. So we work with a lot of people who might be taking supplements, but they're not being processed because you're not digesting them. So we want to stoke up that front end digestion but we'll also use the skin as a tool to get things in the physical body to lube us up. And so I always tell people, think of yourself as a car engine, right? We get older, we get drier. And so when we're babies, we're more in that cough a time of life. We're kind of, you know, snotty. We're full of a lot more mucus. We're chunky. We're moist, right? So we want to counter those qualities uh, for babies to help them not maybe when they're sick, have so much mucus or have so much built up in their ears or in their chest, right? So we counter the effects of that time of life of kapha. And then when we're in midlife, 
we're more pitta and we're hot and we're doing things and we're metabolizing information, but as, and we need to cool down. But when we get older, we're going into a vata time of life. We become drier, right? We, we learn more about the elderly population having arthritis or, or diseases where things are more cold and hard and rough. And the oilation on the skin is a way to kind of keep your engine um, more moist. There's some very interesting studies on soldiers, uh, medics particularly that went to the Gulf War and they were used to working on Americans and they said that our organs are harder and stronger and uh, more difficult to manipulate. Whereas when they were working on people in the East, they were softer and juicier because their diets just have so much more um, herbs and spices in them and they use oils to keep things moving, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about one way to stay juicy and Annie's gonna tell you a little bit about ghee but if you walk away from only one thing from this presentation, there's only one thing that you're like, you know what, I can do that. I would tell you this is it um, to incorporate ghee into your life. And Annie's going to tell you why it's so magical. Yeah. So we love ghee. <laughs> um, ghee is clarified butter. So for those of you who aren't familiar, it's considered sattvic in Ayurveda, which means it's health giving. And it's a pure golden nectar um, that is what remains from basically heating up unsalted butter to remove any of the contaminants. So it's like a healthy butter. It has a strong capacity for enhancing lipid profile, lowering cholesterol, it's full of antioxidants, and it helps with hormonal function. It also increases digestion um, because it's high in butyric acid, which is a great food source excuse me, great food source for the good bacteria in our gut. <clears throat> it's rich in omega-3s, so it makes it an infl anti-inflammatory. And this is one of my favorite things about ghee is that it helps the physical body to detoxify. So ghee is actually able to be deeply absorbed into tissue and attached to toxins. In Ayurveda, we call this lipophilic mediated detoxification. It pulls those toxins from the tissue into the digestive tract. So um, when you use the restroom, it can be eliminated from the body. It also down regulates enzyme activities responsible for carcinogenic activity in the liver. And it also has a really high smoke point. So you can cook with ghee without it oxidizing and turning carcinogenic. So when I cook, I always use ghee. And um, Jess, do you have anything else you want to add for ghee? I, I adore ghee. There's no way around it. Um, you can, it's also used for wound treatment. Um, we use it for people that might be prepping for surgery um, to have less scar elimination. Remember, we talked about how the body, body can get hard, but if you slather ghee, um, it will make the tissues very um, malleable, which can help with uh, a doctor needing to suture up. So we've had clients use ghee before surgeries to um, limit the scarring. Um, also, sometimes we get asked, what if I'm vegan, right? So if you're a vegan, sesame oil is something that we recommend as an alternative because it also has a very high heat point. I am a huge fan of olive oil because everybody knows this, if they know me on how Greek I am, but it does turn carcinogenic when you cook with it. There's also studies that show that if it's exposed to light, it also turns rancid. So if you're going to use those types of healthy oils, you want to make sure that the can is kind of sealed, right? But then also don't cook with it. Just add it to your food after when you're done. One other, one other thing that I really love about ghee is it increases the bioavailability of food. So mm, we've been talking yes. a lot about how when you eat, uh, whatever you're able to really take nutrition from is what how you benefit from it, right? So ghee actually helps to carry nutrients from um, across the intestinal wall so it can be used by the body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a couple more hands in the chat. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It says, where do you get ghee? Oh, good question. Yeah. Oh, gosh, just about anywhere. So um, ghee is starting to get more mainstream. First of all, you can make it yourself. Uh, if you get butter and you cook it, we actually have a recipe on, I think it's on my website, it might be on yours too, Annie, um, where you cook it. And I have to tell you, it's a lot of fun to make. Um, if you have kids and you want to nerd out, I highly recommend the experience, but you'll cook it on a low heat and you'll 
start to see the white um, thing, like impurities start to bubble up. So you'll see, um, basically you're removing casein and you're removing the lactose um, to make this more digestible. <clears throat> so it'll bubble up, you'll skim it off, and then there'll be like a sediment on the bottom that you want to remove. And you're going for that golden nectar that's in the middle. So you can make it yourself. If not, um, it is at Whole Foods, it's at Publix, it's at Target's. Um, also, there are a lot of... Um, I partner with Banyan. They sell it. Sometimes they have good sales. Um, you can click on them from our website and order it. And then Gary and Son is another one that I really like because they have a great sourced ghee. Um, and you can even go further with ghee. Let's say you know you're toxic and you know you're super high in pitta. They'll have herbs infused in certain ghees to make it more bitter and more pungent to help the body detox. So it's another way to get a source into you. Um, and you could probably get it on Amazon too. And, and that was a good point you made, Jess, that you can consume ghee even if you are lactose intolerant because yes. there's no casein. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the only question? Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to balance each dosha. So Annie's going to walk you through a little bit more specific. Maybe you've identified that, you know, you're Vata. You've got this fast moving lifestyle. You're a little nervous. You're a little imbalanced sometimes. Maybe you ruminate a little too much and you overthink in the mind. And maybe you're a little bit more prone to constipation. So I'm going to let Annie talk about how to balance at home if you're Vata. Yeah. So vata, again, is associated elementally with um, air and ether, uh, just to recap a bit. And so we're going to want to um, balance that fast moving energy, like Jess mentioned, with developing a routine, uh, eating and sleeping. We already mentioned the eating, but also going to sleep at the same time each day gives a feeling of stability for someone with a vata imbalance. Also, we mentioned um, abhyanga or oil application, someone with a vata imbalance is going to want to use warm sesame oil and you can just apply this to the skin each morning. That's going to keep the body warm and nourished. And it's actually really grounding for the mind too. It, it calms the nervous system. Staying warm, avoiding excessive exposure to wind and cold, uh, when possible covering your neck and head to prevent from the elements. Not sure anyone's having that specific problem right now with it being summer, but maybe. Uh, and then with yoga, meditation, and pranayama, you're going to want to favor grounding, calming practices, and setting aside time each day to ground yourself, to feel peace and calm. And then to go back to diet and herbs, like we mentioned, you're going to want to favor warming, warming cooked foods, incorporating a lot of those healthy fats like ghee and sesame oil to keep the body lubricated to keep that dryness away. Also, grounding vegetables like sweet potatoes are really good for vata. And then avoiding raw foods and favoring cooked foods and, um, and well-spiced foods. <clears throat> the raw foods are too hard for someone with a vata imbalance to fully digest. <clears throat> Some of the uh, spices that you can incorporate are spices like cumin, coriander seed, clove, salt, black pepper, and cinnamon. Those are all really great for vata. And then drinking warming and calming teas throughout the day, uh, tea like chamomile or ginger. Next for pitta, which is the fire energy or built up heat in the body. You're gonna wanna schedule time each day for enjoyment and just peace. This helps to someone, uh, this helps someone with a pitta um, type to avoid burning out. Also, if you're gonna do the oil application, like we mentioned, you can use coconut oil, which is very cooling to the body. And then staying cool, avoiding excessive sun exposure and heat during the day, wearing hat, to protect your head and your eyes from excessive heat. <clears throat> and then doing workouts in the early morning or in the evening, avoiding uh, doing workouts at the hottest time of the day so you don't overheat the body. For yoga, uh, meditation, and pranayama, we're also going to favor calming yoga and meditation to support that relaxation. And then cooling breaths like shatali. 
For diet and herbs, we're gonna favor fresh fruits and vegetables with an emphasis on cooling food and sweet fruits like watermelon and mangoes, and then also cooling herbs like fennel, mint, and cilantro, and avoiding excessive alcohol and stimulant use. And for drinks throughout the day, we could do something cooling like drinking coconut water. Next, we have kapha. <clears throat> so for kapha, it's going to be really important to wake up with the sun and avoid excess sleep, which is going to be what they're going to want to do. You can dry brush and also use oil. The daily dry brushing will help get lymph moving and avoiding stagnation for that kapha imbalance. You can use light and invigorating oils like safflower or mustard seed. Incorporating sauna is also really good for kapha, <clears throat> promotes circulation and detoxification. And then unlike pitta, a kapha is gonna wanna get moving, favoring intense workouts that provoke sweating. And then for yoga, meditation, and pranayama, we're gonna focus on uplifting and invigorating yogic practices that support inspiration, like a fast moving vinyasa practice. And then also incorporating variety into your weekly routine. Kaphas tend to get stuck doing the same monotonous thing over and over. So we kind of want to break that up purposefully. Diet and herbs, we're going to favor fresh fruits like apples, lemons, limes, and steamed vegetables. Steamed vegetables because we're going to want to avoid um, using excessive uh, heavy cooking oils and consuming uh, excessive dairy and sweets. We're also going to avoid cold drinks. <clears throat> Good spices for someone with kapha is going to are going to stimulate the digestion, and they're going to be uh, spices like clove, cinnamon, cayenne, black pepper, and pipli. Anything like warming and invigorating. For drinks, you're going to favor warm warm drinks like ginger or stimulating drinks like green tea or chai. And I'm going to underscore pipoli because that's one of my favorites. It's long pepper and most people don't know what it is. It has an amazing affinity for the lungs. You can order it just about anywhere and replace pepper with it. It's got a more savory flavor to it, but you could crush like if I know COVID's going around right now. Um, I spent two days on pipoli to clear out my lungs. So you take it, it's hard. You just kind of crush it and then add some hot water to it and maybe some tea and drink it or put it on your food. But once you taste pipoli, you're like, ah, I don't want black pepper anymore because it's just so much more flavorful. <laughs> so we've gone through a lot of uh, different types of things that you could do at home. There's something else that I kind of like to share with people that's very foreign for most um, people that are not familiar with Ayurveda. So there is a sacred practice in Ayurveda called Shirodhara. Um, so you have warm oil that flows over your forehead for about 45 minutes to an hour. If someone is very uh, toxic and out of balance, we do something called panchakarma. It's an intensive nine day um, treatment. It can be longer. Sometimes it's a month, but we work with people to help them um, change their diet a little bit on the front end. We give them herbs to support their process. And there's a then they'll come on site and do different types of massage to eliminate um, toxins from the body with a lot of oils. We do something called Shirodhara to help lower that anxiety, get control of that nervous system. Um, and then we work on that digestion elimination. So it ends up being like a nine day process where people can either do some of it at home or work with somebody that has a clinic. So what Shirodhara does is again, you lay down 45 minutes to an hour, this warm herbalized oil flows over your forehead. And we do trigger specific nerves on the, on the forehead to help lower anxiety, um, improve mood, people who can't sleep, maybe you have migraines or headaches, this provides amazing relief. It's the kind of the equivalent to EEG biofeedback, if anybody's familiar with it, it puts you into a meditative state. So they've shown MRIs kind of before and after where your brain waves shift. Um, so it's excellent at lowering high blood pressure. Uh, we use it for detoxification, some of the herbs are used for specific outcomes that we're trying to achieve. 
So in Ayurveda, they believe that there are pathways on the scalp that uh, are direct to the brain. And I believe someone not too long ago won a Nobel Prize proving those types of pathways on the skin. So the goal is to use herbs that improve communication, that are great um, for lowering stress, um, mind uh, nervines to help you kind of calm down and sleep, but also um, for detoxification of the brain. Um, and we also use it to um, help somebody with trauma. So we have a lot of individuals who may have had trauma, maybe they have PTSD, they've had, um, maybe it's physical, maybe it's mental, and it's not something that they can verbalize or communicate, which is fine. Um, Sheridara helps them relax, puts them into a safe space, and we will see people kind of let go of things while they're um, undergoing the treatment. It's a way to kind of face something without experiencing it. So there's a lot of, um, spiritual or emotional healing that's tied it's a very loving experience so you feel very calm safe and welcomed to um not think about what's bothering you in that moment in time any questions diana is wondering if she'll be able to get a copy of the slides yes yeah we'll go ahead and share that and then if anybody wants to know what their dosha is i can send them a link for that as well um there are quizzes all over the internet I just encourage people to do it twice. You want to do it once as a child, right? So you're going to do it once when you're younger, because the theory is that you were closest to your natural state of health when you were younger. Life happened in between. You had car accidents, um, our food supply, um, stress, viruses, children, work, work comp, put that in there. Um, and then you went out of balance. So then take that quiz a second time so that you can kind of see, okay, where am I imbalanced now? Um, I also encourage people to do the quiz because it's going to help you learn the qualities that we talked about, right? We lofted a lot of vocabulary here about qualities, vata is cold, rough, dry, hard, right? And then pitta is oily, hot, spreading, whereas kapha is more sticky, heavy, thick. Um, so when you're trying to balance the body, you want to kind of start recognizing those qualities in everything you eat and in everything you do. So if you're a kapha person and you're, or you're maybe out of balance with kapha and you want to lose weight, kind of common sense, right? You're not going to eat those heavy, thick, sticky things. You're going to eat the things that are super light. Um, and then if you're overheated, we're going to go more cooling. Uh, that's why we tell Vata people, don't eat anything cold, rough, hard, dry, right? So I have a lot of people that I love broccoli, but it might be the worst food for you in this moment because it's going to aggravate the imbalance that you have going on. So we tell people to change the quality of the food they're eating, right? So maybe you want to warm it up, spice it up with cumin, coriander, fennel, add some ghee to it, things like that so that it becomes warmer and more easily digested. Um, so doing that quiz really helps you connect with self and say, okay, this is what I, my goal, and this is where I'm out of balance. And then you'll start to go through life and maybe you realize, wow, I'm really quick to anger. Um, that's Pitta, right? So you can say, this is not me. This is Pitta. Um, or maybe all of a sudden you're feeling really sad and depressed and it's not you, it's a physical imbalance in the body. It's Vata, right? So, or maybe it's Kapha. And so we figure out what type of imbalance is going on where and i just the quizzes they don't make them perfect don't worry about it um but they are a good little tool to start kind of educating your thought process and connecting a little bit more with ayurveda <clears throat> um and then we're also sharing oh go ahead annie oh no you go ahead <laughs> I was going to say, we we do have a couple of articles that kind of drill down to some of the topics that we talked about. Um, you can learn a little bit more about ghee, and there's a recipe on there how to make your own ghee. Um, a little bit more about in-depth, like if you do want to work with an Ayurvedic practitioner and start adopting an Ayurvedic lifestyle, what, what should that process look like? Um, Annie wrote an amazing article about all the wonderful things um, for turmeric. And we have articles on a little bit more in depth about what is Shirodara and how it heals the physical body as, as well as the mental. And um, Annie's got an article on oil pulling and water. I mean, you'll be blown away by how water um, has an ability to heal and, and harm at the same time, right? So I think there's one more question in the chat. Yep. So Sunji is wondering what Ayurveda's opinion is about fasting, intermittent fasting. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so great question. Okay, so there's a couple of perspectives on that. So Ayurveda is all about fasting. Um, they don't, we want those three set times, right? So maybe later in the afternoon, like maybe your last meal is at six o'clock, you shouldn't eat until later in the day. True, healthy Ayurvedic yogis probably only eat twice a day. Um, the mixed perspective is a lot of people can't fast. So if you are vata predominant and you are out of balance with vata, the worst thing in the world you could do for your body, according to Ayurveda, would be to fast. You wouldn't be able to do it. Those are the people that just, they don't eat every hour, they pass out, right? So we don't go straight to that for them. We're going to go to kicking up your digestion first so that it's able to manage fasting. Um, and it's a great tool. In, in true Ayurveda, they'll tell you um, if you didn't go to the bathroom after you ate, you have no business eating the next meal because you didn't process it. And that's your bet. That's kind of like your report card. Um, does that answer the question on fasting? It's kind of timed and, and individualized. Yeah, I think it's uh, interesting to note, too, that if you do have a certain imbalance, like if you are very Vata, you might want to fast, right? So we tend to have cravings for the things that make us more out of balance. So um, I think the general recommendation in Ayurveda would be from supper time until morning time, at least 12 hours, and then like five hours between each meal, no food is recommended.